cell bud. Right. Most likely this, this would not be placed up as well, right? So I just want to get into this. So you see the same heading there in the slide? It's the same heading in your textbook. Let's get into this one. Um, hopefully it comes up. Because again, my screen seems to be doing something else, right? Okay, so here we have, um, I think normally there was something else on that side, right? So here we have uh, the sources of law Right, um, I'm just trying to get back the screen in the head, right? So the sources of law, still have to admit someone behind the scene too. Right, again, I'm just remember that normally uh, I tend to be online here about quarter to nine. If, if everybody comes in together, it would kind of have a smooth start to the class, right? Um, they, they having to stop in addition to the screen, not doing what it's supposed to be doing this morning has cost us some time. Right, um, so right, so this one here, what are you looking at? And um, I guess what I'll do in a bit is probably just take this and do some explanation, right? So what do you say in terms of, um, in terms of, of, I guess, society then, you have what is known as, well, law, right? But I guess most people will notice that you have already two types of law, right? You have, um, and this is not just in health and safety, this is if you were doing a law course this morning, it's the same concept that, you have basically two sources of law. So like one source of law is what they call statute law, and another source of law is common law. Now, um, we have to know something about these because, and again, this is gonna take the bulk of the class because uh, in time past, they have asked for the differences between them. Now, I don't think it's gonna be much of a good question based on the new format anyway. But if you turn your books to like page A, just one page away, you see what I'm talking about, that uh, initially, um, having done a session on these, you have to come up with some differences between the two types of law. So if you turn the page, what you'll see, you'll see now, you'll see criminal and civil, right? So now, criminal and civil is actually like the daughters of these sources of law, right? If I can... Um, grab my marker without the screen changing anyway, right? Um, the, the, the offshoot then of statute law is what we call criminal law. I'll explain this in a bit for you. Uh, so what that means is, um, is whether or not a Christian says criminal or statute, it is kind of like the same thing. The only difference is that um, one is a type of the other one. Right, so criminal law, uh, criminal law is what they call a type. It's a type of statute law. And it's the main type in fact, which is that when you turn the page, you'll see it has gone into criminal law, right? So one is like the daughter of the other one. So criminal law is a type of statute law. And then you have civil law is a type of um, common law. Now. In, like I said, in academics, though, it is actually different because um, based on the heading, one is a source and the other one is a type, right? So I, I want to say that like in the, in the past exams, which you all are now under the new open book scheme, sometimes that would be a tricky question. Sometimes they would ask for two marks to identify a source of law. And of course, what they were looking there for was statute and come on. And then some other papers you'd see identify two types of law, which will be civil and criminal. But it is, I suppose you say, I guess, um, as I mentioned, daughter, their daughter is like, oh, I guess kids are different from their parents, but still in a way are part of their parents or something like that, that criminal law in itself is something a bit different, but it doesn't exist without statute law. The source of it then remains what is called statute law. And um, we can go into this now. I have it on the other slide as well, right? Um, so let me just talk a little things here before I get to the other side, because as we get to that one, at least I have this here, you'll see it already. So what it says is that statute law is made by the state, right? The word statute comes from the word state. At least the E is not in it here, but uh, statute is from the state and the state then is like the government, right? Just doing the explanation for now. So the state, is like the government. You, you can think of this as the, the many, you know, media briefings you are seeing because of COVID-19 anyway. And you hear the Minister of Health talking about our regulations, 
right? And um, if you, for example, the regulations now it talks about wearing the mask, right? And what happens is that, so that regulations is statute law because it's made by the state. And if you were found then not to be with your mask on, I guess in a public place, what they say then you are seen as a lawbreaker and in that way you are seen as a criminal. You'll get a ticket, I don't know if you know this, you'll get the ticket and you'll have to go, I'm not too sure if they have other places to pay, but you normally will have to go to the magistrate's court to get it paid and as, and as you get into the magistrate's court, you are, you are almost treated as a criminal and they're gonna you know, like do a search on you directly to the pay station, etc. But you are seen in the eyes of the law as a lawbreaker. You are seen in the eyes of the law as a criminal. So that's how, um, that is how one is a type of the other one, right? You are only seen as a criminal if you break the law of the land or the law of the state, right? The other one, uh, common law or and the type of that being civil law. Uh, this is actually not the topic today. This is the topic next week. But as we have them on this slide and we're talking about the two sources of law, we're going to use this opportunity right to just mention like the differences in them. So civil law now have to do with really uh, persons. It doesn't have to do with any breaking of any law of the land. Common law though is like what they say is like the law of neighbors, right? Um, the person have not really broken the law of the land, but it could have been like where a neighbor Right, a neighbor, um, let's say, I mean, the simplest example, I guess, and of course, not the best one, but I guess the simplest one in Trinidad is, uh, I guess, two neighbors fighting for common in Trinidad, right? A piece of land or something, right? Somebody moved uh, the bone. That's a common thing in Trinidad, anyway, right? Now, they have not broken, they are, they, I mean, they haven't broken, and, and they haven't broken the, 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 the law of the land, but they have actually done what is like wrong then, they have done a wrong and what is gonna happen in a case like that is that one neighbor, most likely is gonna get a lawyer and probably take the other neighbor to court, right? So that is a civil matter and it have to do with what is called common law. Um, the source of this, let me just go a little bit slow here. So that land issue is a civil matter, right? Just make that clear to date. So the land issue is a civil matter and of course, I mean, that, that could not have been the best example. I mean, a really good example for health and safety here would have been perhaps an employer, let's say this is the employer, fired an employee wrongfully, right? Let's say they would have, uh, and I mean, when I mean wrongfully, there's a lot of explanations that I can give you. For example, um, if something is not on your job description, right? If something is not on your job description, if you have that anyway, it may you know, be taken to be that if you were asked to do something outside of your JD, this has happened before and you refuse to do that, you can be, you, you, I guess you could be victimized and then fired. But the point is, if it wasn't in your job description or in your contract, then that is grounds for a civil matter, right? So it didn't have to be land, like I said, that's the simplest one I could have think about. But that, that, that is a civil matter, right? So the civil matter is the employer wrongfully firing the employee. And like I said, that's a civil matter. But what is the source then? What is the source of that law, right? The source of that law, uh, for those who know, is actually old laws, or should I say old case or old case law, right? The, the source of that, the source, right, is gonna be old case law and really old. I mean, for those who know what precedent is, precedent is past cases that would have been collected by the law entity in the world then. So if there is a matter, let's say this was uh, Frank and Henry, right? Um, what the judge will do in that case, I guess you can get an idea from this, like um, I think we have all seen Judge Judy where a matter is brought before her, right? But um, Frank and Henry, I, I'm not too sure what I'm to the market yet, right? But um, I think you get the idea that um, and I've lost the marker for some strange reason, right? Um, right, so I'll just put, right, Frank and Henry there. Um, so yeah, so if there's a judge listening to this, you can pity it like Judge Judy, and let's say she is having a difficult time making up her mind, well, who should I, you know, I mean, I guess give compensation to 
right? Uh, or maybe what is the worth? In fact, most of the times is what is the worth of the compensation? The judge can look back to see if there was another similar case, right? And in the world of law, I was saying, they started collecting these cases, I think they say from the 10th century, which will mean almost, um, what, a thousand years ago, they started collecting these cases. So there must be somebody that lived before that had a similar matter. And this is just a simple one anyway. So the judge will look back. And again, I mean, I think in today's day and age, you do have to look back far. Uh, I think they, 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 they go in rate of for compensation without injury in Trinidad and Tobago is close to 100,000 TT. Just have been wrongfully dismissed. I know because like I said, right, about 110. About 110,000 TTs they go in read. So that would have been something the judge would just look back to. And that's what I mean by a source. They'll look back to like uh, books. They'll look back to um, websites that have cases collected on it. And they would see, okay, you know, two years ago, we had a very similar issue. And a worker who was wrongfully dismissed, I could actually give it a name by the company because the company is no longer in Trinidad. Um, a company called Sunway International. And I chose this one because it's no longer in Trinidad anyway. Or at least not in the way that they were before, right? So they can look back and say, well, you know, those that in that case, uh, the judge awarded 110,000 TT. So then likewise, I am going to award Henry 110,000 TT as well. So you have this civil matter, but the source of reference being here, old cases or precedents. If you have some... Um, if you have a marker or whatever, a penny, you can just write it in there. And the base, what's supposed to be is with precedence is actually not the class today, right? But as I said, as we're trying to differentiate between these two types, um, we can differentiate without telling you that one is the law of the land set by the government, and the other one is based on old cases that would have been collected over years by the law um, entities, right? And uh, just in case, yeah, you find that's abstract. I don't know if you all have ever gone to the industrial site. Sorry, try to add in some person still. The industrial court website, the industrial court has, this is Trinidad and Tobago we're talking about. The industrial court has a website. And um, uh, if you don't, you can just go up on the website and just have the class. You would see they normally publish the latest ruling coming out of cases heard in the industrial court. Right, so in case you want to, um, I guess, see, I guess what you call that in Trinidad, people's business, I guess, um, you want to see, or maybe you just want to know if this thing exists anyway, just go on um, the industrial court website, the, 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 the up-to-date cases or the cases that I heard recently, they normally have them like a ribbon, it ribbons on the screen, right? So you can click those, or I guess if you go into where they have a collection of cases, you, you could get those as well. Right. Um, so tell me if you're okay with that. That's a lot of explanation for just three words, I guess, on this slide. But um, I was I was trying, like I say, to do to do um, the full explanation there. Right. So on the other slide, let us get to the other one. So statute law, and I'll read out all of this. So statute law, deals with law made by the state. We would have covered that. It is defined as a written law of the land. It can be in the form of acts or regulations. So you should be familiar with these because, like I said, of the many uh, media briefings you hear and then you know, the Ministry of Health regulations. So yes, the law of the land can be in the form of an act or a regulation. We'll get into that just now. I want to finish up this slide. But they are different. But if you break the act, you are seen as a criminal. And if you break a regulation, it's the same thing. You are seen as a criminal. Both of them. Uh, instruments then of um, statute law. Does somebody have a bread van or something passing? I know we have them as well too, but at least not for the morning, right? Um, just let me get that out to the way. All right, yeah. So um, an act is known as a statute, as you saw on the slide before, statute law. A regulation is known as a statutory instrument for uh, matters in which you are seen as a criminal, the prosecution, which would normally be the state, the prosecution is the state, if they have state lawyers, must prove their case beyond all reasonable doubt. Now, again, this is um, typically more meant for 
more serious crimes like um, murders, the prosecution must prove their case beyond all reasonable doubt. There used to be um, a TV show on on a Saturday. By that hey, so. yes, hi. Hey, this room, honey here. I'm not yes. seeing that slide on statute law. Oh, okay. I have you see um, criminal law. Oh, is it on the screen you are talking about, or is it in? Yeah. The on your screen, just the, the, the slider there is different from the right. one that I have. My screen I mean, seems to be doing something a bit different. Like, let me just try to share that again. But it is relevant to the discussion. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, but I say now, my my screen is doing something different. Yeah. Just tell me if you're seeing it. Because I did share. Yeah, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that I am seeing your slide. Yeah. But that is different from the handout that we got. That slide is is, is not there. Okay, right. I wouldn't be able to try that for you, for you know, anybody Yeah, else? yeah. Okay. So the slide is missing or something? Yeah, I, right. I guess. So, yeah. I think what we're trying to say is that we maybe have our older version of the slides. If you have an right. updated version yeah. down here that you're showing us. Right. Yeah. We right. would like that to be said. Yeah. Well, what we could do, um, I could um just see to that after the class and probably forward you that slide. I'm not too sure how that would have happened anyway, right? Um, uh, but do you have something like it? Because I know, I mean, I do change it from one cycle to another cycle sometimes, but initially these things remain at the, at the core of it. So do you have a slide in this course, statute law? No, I have criminal law and common law, civil law. Right. No, nothing with statutes. Okay, you you can. I have um, sorry to interject there, but I have statute law. Exactly what you are reading, sir. Right. So that could have. Yeah, been. I have it as well too. Yeah. Okay. I, I so, so Ruhani, right? So what I'll do, I would um, I guess you could still listen in. I, I wouldn't expect yeah. you to write this down because I mean it's just enough sure. for me to forward the proper one for you in a bit, right? So I guess no problem. Do, yeah, we would. I mean, these things are group emails anyway, so um, you, you, you may get back this as a group email as well. So I guess if you have it, you just ignore it. And if you don't have it, you just take it from there anyway, right? But uh, definitely don't write anything down because it's just a matter of forwarding it back to you as well, right? Um, so let's move on. So I was saying um, the prosecution must prove their case beyond all reasonable doubt. And um, that is more meant for serious crimes and... Uh, you know, like in the case of murders, per se, that, that the state have to prove their case against the person that committed the crime uh, beyond all reasonable doubt. Some people say, why? Why? Because the thing is, at the end of, um, I guess, of a serious crime, or I guess a murder, the penalty then could be things like life imprisonment, or in some countries, even death. So you want to make sure then that the, the prosecution or the state did prove their case beyond all reasonable doubt, right? Um, you are a criminal if you commit a crime against the state. The main sanction includes uh, imprisonment and fines. Um, the offenses in which somebody breaks a law could be seen to be indictable or a summary offense, right? Now, I'll come back to that just now. The burden of, of proof to defend themselves is normally on the employer. And statute law does not involve compensation for the injured party, right? So um, just this one here, uh, and there's so much a little truth here, but the thing is they are on some other slides as well, right? So indictable and summary offense. Um, you, you may have heard these words by listening to the news. Again, these two words are meant to say the seriousness at which the person broke the law. For example, a summary offense is a less serious offense. Um, summary then could be, I guess, the case of the mask, right? Not wearing your mask, a speeding ticket, right? If, if you break the law in that sense, you, you are seen to commit a summary offense, right? Very classic examples is, um, and really simple ones, right? That if, um, if you had an accident, I guess uh, a minor accident, just like last week again, on the road with your vehicle, but you did not go and report it to the police station. That in itself is a summary offense, right? The word indictable is taken to be more serious uh, offenses and crimes. And again, you normally would hear 
if you listen to the news here, like where, you know, um, they would have arrested the person that, that committed a crime, and then they say charges would have been laid indictably. Now, indictably means it's a serious offense. And there is also another meaning behind the word, which is there is the intended for imprisonment, right? Um, a summary offense doesn't carry imprisonment unless if you don't go and pay the ticket, right? But naturally, a summary offense doesn't carry uh, a jail time with it. But the indictable offenses, um, automatically then, there is almost that notion that if you are found guilty, you would be sentenced to jail then, right? So indictable and summary uh, meant for uh, serious and less serious offenses anyway. Right, I want to move on. Um, now, the truth is I'm telling you, um, with this open book exam, these things are right in front of you. I guess you could only imagine, I know Durson is there too, that, um, that before students had to cram all of these things, now it's right there, it's, it's right there in front of you to look back at and use for the open book exam, right? Um, uh, when these would come, uh, in, uh, and again, I said last week, the old days here now mean December 2019, these were not very big questions, right? Uh, you're looking at two mark questions. Um, if there was a question strictly on statute law, you normally will get the mark for when they ask you for the differences, which is on page eight, when they start to talk about the differences between criminal and civil, that's when you can probably pick up four marks. They would never give it for the full eight marks or 10 marks. It would just be for four marks anyway. Uh, again, like I said, I mean, the open book thing makes it so easy to just open your book and to check the answers, right? So if you want, let's probably take one from the book page eight. Let's take, let's take two from the book. Let's take two differences from the book. Keep it in mind that today, the, um, the heading really wasn't really civil law, but I did a little bit of explanation in order to put started law into context. So we should be able to get at least two differences here um, anyway, right? So from the book on page eight, you can see uh, criminal law, the action is brought by the state, right? And so we had mentioned that before. The Difference being, uh, civil law action is brought by the individual, which is called a claimant. So nobody will do this for you if you have been fired wrongfully. I think I may have mentioned this something last week to that. If, if you were injured, and I mentioned I know a lot of students of mine who came through here and they took up civil law cases. I don't know if I mentioned that any first day. I know um, some of those compensation was about more than half a million TT dollars, right? One of them was on price math. I don't know if I mentioned that one to you. But, um, you know, like nobody will do that for you. This person, they wanted price math. I tell them, this is price math in Laramie. They, they wanted price math. They didn't know that they had a case. I know I shared something with this with you already, right? So they didn't know they had a case. And it was only when they heard us talk about this and the fact that they can, you know, um, go to court and try to get some compensation anyway did they take it up? So nobody will do it for you if you have been fired and you take that, as they would say in Trinidad. Or I guess um, a lot of Trinidadians, you know, and I actually find this going up the islands too, like if you go up the Caribbean more, more so in, when you go up to the Caribbean, like Grenada, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and stuff that a lot of people tend to have the belief that they will leave them to God. So something happened to you, but you'll say, no, leave them to God, right? So that may be the mentality for some people. But, but, but if you do decide to take up a case, you take it up, but nobody will do it for you then. So the action is brought by the individual. And maybe one more, uh, maybe the second one. Now we could do more, but like I said, the, the today really wasn't really about civil law, right? The second one, I guess we, we can do that as well, where it says, the intention of criminal law is to punish. You break the law, so you're seen as a criminal, and then there's a punishment. You didn't wear your mask. The ticket you're getting is means as a punishment for you not uh, wearing the mask, right? As is a means of complying with the law, but if you don't comply with the law, there is punishment attached. Whereas in civil law, the idea of two persons, employer, employee, going to court, or two neighbors, the idea was not to put anybody in jail, but the idea was the party that was wronged or the victim then would want to try to get 
compensation, right? So you see, we're starting to develop those differences there. In no way are we finished because, um, like I said, the lesson today was not really civil law anyway. There's really more statute law, right? So I guess for Rohani, I don't know if you have this one either. I'll, I'll read out this one. The thing about this one here, this is not exam material. This is just how a law is passed, right? This is really not Nibosh material. I mean, not Nibosh, and that this is not an exam question. Because we are looking at statute law, we want to just talk about how a law is passed, right? So a law is regarded as primary legislation. It normally starts off with a document called a consultation document, and at that phase, they call it green paper. Don't learn any of this. I mean, this is just to talk about how a law is passed anyway, right? After the consultation phase, a bill is produced, and then the bill is normally read three times in Parliament as a contents may need changing. It is about a 40-day process. And um, like I said, this explanation I'm doing is really more to talk about how laws are passed in Trinidad and I guess in the UK as well, right? I guess in the final stages there, if bill gets through the preliminary stages, it is sent in the UK to the Queen in Trinidad to be sent to the President for what they call royal assent, after which time it is not regarded as the law or an act of parliament, right? So um, there is more to this, but none of this is a law exam. Just let me, just that. Again, if you have your mic here darker, so you could just probably mute yourself a bit. I have muted you though. Right. Um, yeah, so that there's a little bit more to this that um, if you have been in the process, you probably would know the consultation document is a huge document. It almost looks like a folder. Normally, um, a team will put this together. You can probably think of this as, um, let me just use, I guess, not, a, not the best example, right? Um, but again, a relevant example to keep your interest, which would be like the property tax, um, you know, bill then, right? So that would have been develop in like a, a file, a folder, you'd have ministers working on it. And uh, you'd have also specialist teams working on that, right? Um, by the time it gets to the bill, and uh, the bill is produced after the consultation, I wonder if, again, consultation is with members of the public. I have been part of some of these as well. Consultation is like they will say they are meeting in the town hall, they were meeting in um, the what do you call this place in Kuva? The, the uh, I think it's the Rujanad Capadio Center. You're meeting there, we're meeting in the Hyatt. And you have different stakeholders. So they all say, well, we want this, we want that, we want this, we want that. At the end of that, a bill is produced. The bill is really in Parliament. Now, what you need to know here is that this three times is not the same day, right? The bill is read the first time. The first time is read. That's about the first time the opposition would have heard it right? Or whoever was the opposition party at the point in time, right? So the first time they hear it is the first reading. The second reading is often called, I guess, the Trinidad, you know, parlance. So that would be, I guess, the bacchanal stage. The second stage is when you have the ministers having heard it the first time will have their chance to give their views, right? Um, most of the times, if you listen to this on, on, I guess, the news, you hear that they say they recommend that the bill goes to a special committee, privileges committee, something like that, right? So sometimes if you can't get you with the second stage of it, it goes into a committee. But what you need to know is that by the third reading, they cannot make any changes to it or any written changes. The committee would have looked at it at the second stage, take all the opposing views into consideration. And by the third reading, it's basically final, right? Again, like I said, there's a lot of days in between the first and the, and the last reading. By the last reading though, you could make what they say is like a verbal contribution. But after that, once it gets the majority of the votes, it will be passed and then you see that bill. Well, of course, once it's signed by the president of Trinidad here, yeah, will become an act, right? So all of that really is not for this exam, but it is fair to the topic then to explain it the way it should be um, in the topic, but really none of that is the subject of your um, exam anyway. So I'm keeping on here. Statute law, we mentioned regulations before. So regulations are made by the Secretary of State as a result of the HSC proposal, uh, the consultation documents. In April 2008, the HSC was incorporated into what we call the HSE 
right? So in the UK, there is no more HSC. Now, why did I put HSC here to confuse you? Well, I didn't want to confuse you. The first thing again, I'll tell you for the two time today or the four time, but this is not really your exam material. It's just, it, it is your material, but it, it doesn't come for your exam then. This exam is not like that. Your exam more is like an accident happens and it's the interpreted, right? Anyway, um, but to put HSC here was to give credit then to where credit is due. At the point in time, it was the HSC, right? So today, 2020, the HSC is now called the HSE in the UK, but they were the ones who had this work here with these regulations, right? So the HSE must consult all interested parties. I'm gonna go a little bit slow here. Now again, I know some of you all, as, as you all are totally new, um, I didn't mention the HSE last week as being the health and safety executive. In, in, in your mind, you may be thinking it's the health and safety officer, but it's not, right? It's the health and safety executive, and it is a place in London, right? It's a big, I, I don't know if I have a pity of it here. I know sometimes I would have put a pity of something here. Uh, I guess if you want, it's not here. You could probably just want, it's a big glass building. It looks like the Hyatt anyway, but the HSE then. So when they say HSE, just, just don't think of it as health and safety officer, right? It's not that in the UK. So the health and safety executive, so this is like, um, the only way to tell you this is that this is like the OSHA in the UK, right? For those who know OSHA is in Duke Street, Port of Spain anyway. So when you say HSE here, this is the government building in London. It's called Soho, by the way, the part of London is S-O-H-O, -O, Soho, London. And um, here's where you're gonna have the government inspectors then, or all those in charge of health and safety in the UK in that one building. It is a, a high rise building anyway, right? So when they say the HSE must consult with all interested parties, you could think of this as, um, I guess, the opposition, we were talking about them, or any interest group that you may have. The Secretary of State can make them on his own initiative or her initiative must, but, but, but must consult with the HSC first, right? And then the regulation must be laid before parliament and made under the HSW Act 1974. So some explanation here again is that, I'll take it back to the top. Now, again, um, I have realized that students, I mean, this is like two marks, if they were to ask who makes a regulation, the answer for it is the Secretary of State in collaboration with the HSE. If you read through this, you'll see it. HSE must consult with all interested parties. And one of those would be the Secretary of State because the Secretary of State could make the regulations on their own, but they must first consult with the HSE. So there seem to be like a two-way relationship here between the Secretary of State and the HSE. So I was saying before, I know this sounds confusing. As I did tell you before, this lesson is if you came in just around 10 to 9. But again, we try to make it simple for you. So somebody ways to make it simple for you to tell you who the Secretary of State is. Right? So let me tell you who it is. So the Secretary of State, right? That phrase is actually a phrase, right? That's how they say minister in the UK. So if you read this over and we put in Minister Terence Deal saying, you'll see how much sense it makes now right? In the UK, and by the way, the same thing in the US. If you have seen those movies, you know, um, London Has Fallen, those recent movies that have, um, you know, um, that government aspect of it now, right? You'll see they talk about, if you look at any movie on, I guess, on TV, and you're looking at a US movie, like where they take, I mean, God forbid, of course, and like someone in the White House hostage, you hear they say the Secretary of State. So that phrase, Secretary of State, in the US and the UK is meant to say minister, right? So let me just, so, so just see if I get to this. So like how we have the Minister of Health, the Minister of Labor, the Minister of Tourism, right? The Minister of Social Development. That's what they have. They will have the Secretary of State for Labor, the Secretary of State for Tourism, etc. right? So if you read this over, now you have to, I mean, like I said, know the property is secretary of state, but to get it to understand it, we can say 
that regulations, just like how you have the health regulations in Trinidad, regulations are made by the Minister of Health. See if that makes any sense. Because the Minister of Health is the Secretary of State for Health. Instead of saying Minister in the UK, they say Secretary of State of, and there's a, a Minister for everything. In other words then, there's a Secretary of State for everything as well. So if you read down here, you'll see, just put in here, and we could put in Minister of Health, Terence Dial Singh, because that is what's on news every day anyway. That's what is in everybody's mind. So I'll use that one. A year ago, I would have been saying um, the Minister of Labor, Ms. Jennifer Bittes Primus, but um, I don't know if it's actually still Ms. Jennifer Bittes Primus. Come, that's a year ago, I would have been saying that, right? But I would say Terence Dial Singh anyway. So we say here, the Minister of Health can make their own regulations but they should consult, I guess, with the public first or with the opposition first, right? See if it makes any sense. So what you're seeing here, let me just draw my stick figure again. What you're seeing here is that the Secretary of State, just in case you're missing it, right, is really a person. Terence the Singh is a person. It's a man or a woman, it's a person. And this person have the power to make regulations. Right? Based on what minister you are, you can make a regulation for your ministry. For example, Terence D. L. Singh is the Minister of Health, so he can make a health regulations. Right? The Minister of Labor could make one for health and safety on their own. It'd have to go before Parliament, of course, though, right? But on their own and with consultation, I guess, with any relevant stakeholder, the person then could put pen to paper and write in a regulation. That is the purpose of a regulation. A regulation then is something that could be updated um, quickly, right? Like, you know, they would have a conference, you see it maybe on a Saturday, and by Monday they say the regulation is coming into effect. It's a way of making a law. See if you're seeing this. A regulation is a way of making a law without going through the full parliamentary stages. The slides will seem to want to go back there. But as a way of making a law without going through the full parliamentary stages, the full parliamentary stages would have been this thing about the consultation document, the bill, the bill had to be read three times, 40 days in between, and then finally to the president. Instead of doing all of that with something like with the health regulation, because they want to have this thing in effect, you know, like as of Monday, it will be in the form of a regulation. The Minister of Health makes it. And when the Minister of Health makes it, it is, it is then good as the law. Now, I think, um, I'm trying to add somebody in the back and I've hit the wrong button, right? The, um, so the part that is relevant to health and safety, let me show you the part that's relevant to health and safety, right? So the part that's relevant to health and safety is what you have to know, um, I'll stick to the slides a bit, I'm trying to do the both things, right, is that in the UK, you have more than one law for health and safety, right? In the UK, there is more than one law for health and safety, right? There is then a series of laws. You can, you can probably try to find some of these, it's on page nine, right? Um, some is at the back of there of page 10. I'm seeing some to the top there, right? Um, really does have some on page nine as well, right? But I can't show you all. I mean, this lesson today, all I wanted to do was show you, I think about five or six. And um, the idea behind these is that there is the main law from last week. There is the main health and safety law known as the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974. But in addition to that, there is more laws in the UK for health and safety. Now, I'll go slow with this. Um, before I read out these five or six here, right? Um, what you need to know is what I said is that everything in the UK have a law. Coming back to the first class then, and let me, re let me just re remove the word thing and put the word hazard. Every hazard in the UK has its own law right? And every hazard in the UK has its own regulation, right? Some of them would have an act, some of them would have a regulation. But in short, then, if you say regulation and acts are all laws, every hazard in the UK has its own laws, right? And that is actually the subject of today's homework, but I'll get to that 
at the end of this session, right? So now, so where do you get them? Again, um, look, I have, I guess that I have some of the students who did other courses with us on here. So that you would know before that you had to go and memorize these things you're seeing on page 10, the name of the laws on them, right? And then if you see in the slide, the name of the laws on the side, you had to memorize it. Today, you don't have to go and memorize them. All you have to do is be able to find them, right? You can find them from more of your book. So let's take a read. And uh, like I said, as you go through the course, you'll find every hazard has its own health and safety laws, right? So um, if you want to, again, like I said, you'll have to go through your books. I, I am talking, I'm trying to skim through the pages. I did see some on the page that I showed you there, page nine. If you go to page 21, you'll see one of the laws is ahead head in here. Let's turn to page 21. So as you turn then, or as you, as you turn your books from one chapter to the other chapter, this is especially true for the second textbook that you have. The second textbook you have. I don't know if you have it on your desk because I know um, that is more for the project. But as I mentioned to you before, every hazard, well, sorry, every chapter in the NG2 book is meant for a different hazard. Therefore, every chapter you look at would have its own law anyway, right? So let me just read out this slide for you. And again, you could have your hands on page eight, page nine. Just gonna have your fingers watching page uh, 21. But again, to show you all the laws in one day, you'll get it as you do the course anyway, right? But to show you that the concept here is that they don't have one law for health and safety in the UK. Um, I don't know if you hear people talk about this in Trinidad. Some people say the Trinidad Osh Act then is like a backbone. That's what I'm trying to draw here, right? Some people say it is like, in fact, some people have different words to describe the Osh Act in Trinidad. Some people say it's like a toothless bulldog, meaning it have a lot of back but no bite. And I, and I think in a way, this is what they're trying to say that the Osh Act in Trinidad, we have a framework, but the framework has no flesh on it. Right? And that is what you find it's different in the UK. In the UK, the main law is known as the Health and Safety at Work Act. I'm just going to use the acronym here, the HSW Act, right? But in addition to the main backbone then of the law, that's what we saw today that the ministers could make regulations and they have made regulations for all the hazards. So all the hazards in the UK, they have their own law. So the skeleton then, or the framework of law is fully developed in the UK because it's not just a backbone. We just have the OSHAC. We have no other laws of health and safety in Trinidad. I don't know if you know that. We have some for the environment. We have like air pollution rules and water pollution rules. Those are not really quite legislation anyway. They are legislation, but it doesn't carry the wood regulations behind them, right? So um, in terms of core health and safety, then when I say not air pollution and water pollution, but core health and safety, there is just the OSHAC. Whereas in the UK, you have the HSW Act, but all of these pertain to health and safety as well. So let me just um, read them out, right? So the first one is a very famous one, the Management of Health and Safety at Work Regulations 1999. If you want, though again, like I said, these things could help you in your exam. If you want to start to try to learn them, fine, or you don't have to because it's an open book exam, right? This one here, the provision and use of work equipment regulation, P1 1998. Now, again, if you're in the industry, I don't know if you're in the industry. Let me just talk industry for one for 30 seconds, right? If, in the, if you are in the industry, the industry use these regulations in Trinidad. The reason is that we don't have our own regulations for it. So if you were using a crane, if you had a crane, a gantry crane, a, a tower crane, right? An overhead crane, and they're looking to see, well, what is the law for crane? Trinidad and Tobago, we use PUA. I don't know if you know that. We use all of these laws in Trinidad and Tobago, even though they are not laws in Trinidad and Tobago. But the thing is, if you want a guidance then on manual handling, Trinidad and Tobago doesn't have a law for manual handling. So the whole world uses this law here, the Man and Hand and Operation Regulation 1992, right? If we want a law for PPE, Trinidad doesn't have a law for PPE. How, how, like, how do we know we're just supposed to be given uh, um, a FRC coverall, a fire resistance coverall? 
how do we know then that um, you know the specifications of the gloves and the glasses is Z87? We don't have that in Trinidad. Our OSHAC don't have that, but we get it from the UK laws, right? So like except this, uh, even though um, these are not laws in the OSHAC, it's what they call industry standards that. If, and again, this is only about five or six here, if you were looking at noise on your job site, vibration, a chemical substance, what you have to know, the good news is the UK have a law for that, right? So you didn't have to go far. All you have to do is go to Google, put in UK law for chemicals, UK law for vibration. Now the thing is it is in your NG2 book. I'm just saying somebody who haven't done this course, right? People call me all the time. I know one of you called me this week, I can't, think it was Michelle, but people call me all the time with work-related issues. Courts, people just call courts, the furniture store just call me all the time, right? People call me in the companies, um, you know, they want to know something nobody else knowing, so they want to ask me the, the question anyway. So sometimes I will tell them, go back and get one of these if it's something that I, that I don't know, but sometimes it's something that I do know, I'm, I'm just able to tell them. But the thing is, I am able to tell them because I'm familiar with these regulations then, right? Anyway, let's move on. The Workplace Health Safety and Welfare Regulations 1992. That is what they call the welfare regs. That is how we know today that workers should be given drinking water from a dispenser. That's how we know today. In Trinidad and Tobago, but this is not a law here that workers should be, you know, given um, cups. The, the, um, the whole aspect about temperature, all of those are really from this law anyway. Yeah, the temperature and the work area then. Display screen equipment regulation 1992. Anybody working around a computer as we are today, but I suppose so more than an hour anyway. The manual handling operation regulations 1992 and the personal protective equipment regulation 1992. So all of these are stuff you can get on Google. You don't have to get it. I am saying that if in your work life, you don't have to get it for this exam, if in your work life, something comes up with PPE and you don't know the type of boots to be given and you don't know the specification of the safety glasses, you can just go to Google and put in PPE regulations and see what comes down on that. Right? Um, the, the, the little issues we have with these one hour classes is before I mentioned to you is that these classes used to be four hours long with a break in between, right? And so we would be able to finish like a whole concept. I am looking at the time there now and knowing that um, this concept of course is in no way finished. What we have touched today on is uh, statute law. In a way, all of these are statute law. Let me tell you how, because they are made by the state. The person making this is the minister of whatever, right? The minister of, of course, I don't want to say health because this is health and safety law. In Trinidad and Tobago, this would be the Minister of Labor, right? But the point is the Minister of Labor in Trinidad, government come, government go. This is not the first time. This is not the last 10 years. This is not even the last 20 years. We just have one law for health and safety anyway. The Minister of Labor for all consecutive governments have not added to the OSH Act anyway, right? They have left it the way it is anyway. All right, um, I wanted to come in a bit and see if you have any questions there because I know it does get more confusing. So I don't know if I want to pause and give you the assignment and maybe call that a day for today. It's a little bit after 10 um, because I could go on a bit here, but you have to be able to tell me that you understand so far. We have two slides to go through again. These are tied into that, but I don't want to move on unless you're okay with it so far, right? So let me just do a quick review, right? Um, so we would have said the whole thing about statute law, to be honest with you, and source of law and common law is really for two marks. If they ask it, you can just open your book and see it, right? These things don't go for much more than two marks anyway. Um, plus the idea of the open book exam now, it's more of a case study like where an accident happened. So it's not really to say that they wanted to go and pick out these two words started law and common law before they were tested by asking students identify two sources of law right i don't think that's much of a good question with the open book format anyway in other words it's too easy with the format however we had to cover it because we are coming up to like the good parts of it anyway we spoke all about started law the law of the land uh could be the form of an act or regulation if it is an act it has to go through parliament but if they really want something quick, like Saturday for Monday, 
then instead of going through all the parliamentary stages, the minister himself or herself would write it, consult with whoever the interested parties are. This is health and safety, so I put the agency executive there, the health and safety executive, that government place in London anyway. And then, you know, by Monday, once the president signs it, it becomes law, it doesn't have to go through the full consultation bill, um, reading at the bill stages, et cetera, right? Then the other thing we said was that uh, in the UK, um, really and truly the only way to say this is that they have a law for everything, right? You can think of any hazards that you all had in your first assignment. You had a thing to get 10 hazards. Was it 10? I'm trying to remember. I think it was 10. I think it was 10. I don't think it was less than 10. Uh, I think it was 10, right? Yeah, so 10 hazards. What you have to know is that those hazards have a law for it, right? Um, you may not want to know them by heart because of the, again, the open book format, but you have to know whatever you put there as a hazard. If you had put noise, there's a law for that in the UK. If you had put temperature, there was a law for that. If you put anyone like these, like maybe you put something with manual handling, you can see that law here. Workers not given proper PPE, there's a law for that as well which is the PPE regulations here. I have only listed some here. And again, like I said, um, you, you are not required to learn them by heart. If you want to do that, that is for your knowledge. I mean, you can be seen to be competent if somebody asks you a question and let's say you don't know, but you go and you just check it up on your computer and you come back and you tell them, you know, the law for cranes is this, et cetera, right? So you could be seen to be competent. I don't think any human being have, when I say all the laws, I mean, we mentioned 10, but you know, it's more than 10 hazards. I mean, your first assignment was 10 hazards, but you must know it's more than 10 hazards that have any world. So if you say there's a hundred hazards in the world and you have a hundred laws in the UK, you're not required to know them by heart. You're just required to know that they exist and you can simply get them by putting in Google, UK legislation for, right? Let's think of something weird, radiation, right? UK legislation for um, chemicals. They have about four laws for chemicals. UK legislation for transport hazards, right? They have about four laws for transport as well, four different regulations. So once you know where to find them, your business should be fixed. Whether or not you had the old exam format or this exam format, we never told students to learn them. We just, I mean, not learn, more than what you're seeing here. This was the core of your syllabus, right? And the, the additional ones, you can normally research them anyway. Just come in and let me know what your questions are. Anyone? You, you can simply say that you get it or you didn't get it. So I'll no, know what I to do. So. I'll, know how to, I'll know how to move on to the next two, right? Uh, or if just the pause and give it the assignment. The next two isn't hard. It's in the same thought pattern. That's it. So if you get it now, it will be good that you get it now. Anybody? I completely get it, sir. Okay, you get it. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, we right. got, I, I got it as well. Okay, good. I got okay. it as well. Right, okay, great. Thanks for the feedback there. Um, so let's move on. So the other thing now, again, I'm thinking the best way to do it on the time Right? I, I don't know if you, let me just try to share a white screen with you all. And I'll try to do it on the white screen. So we can just come back and look at the, the writing after. If you read the writing, I'm going to have to explain it anyway. Right? So let me just try to tie it into a little kind of summary chart. Right? You can just tell me when you're seeing the, the white board. I'm not seeing mine as yet, come to think of it. Just tell me when you see the white, the white board to the back. That is it. Yeah, I got the white screen. Yeah, okay. see the white board too. Okay, good. Okay, great. All right. So, so just to kind of, we'll, so, so we'll summarize. So we said before, and I don't really want to start up at statute law, but I guess we could, I'll put an S, right? S is statute. The other one was common law. So we said there are really two types of laws. Don't know what happened to that C there, right? So two types of laws. So if you could just write this, you see that this would be laws here. There are two types of laws in the world, statute and common law. Today, really, we were talking about statute law. So what should I do it here? And in statute law, what we said, statute law could be in the form of an act or a regulation. The act we have in this course is the HSW Act. You have to know too that this is just laws in general though, right? An act can be, in the, sorry, a statute, or statute law could be in the form of act or regulation. If it is an act, it has to go through parliament. If they want a quick update to the statute law though, 
a person will make it. We refer to that person as the Secretary of State uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. You can think of it as the Minister and the Minister. But it is really a real person. It's not an imaginary person. It's a real man that will take a pen and paper and just write in what he wants into this thing. Probably will have a team working with him to tell him and he will dictate them what they want and stuff. But the point is, it's a person, right? So the rest of it now is some here. Then the next two things I wanted to say is this. The next two things is that in addition to the thing they call regulation, the slides we have there, and if you have yours, you'll see them, there's something called an approved code of practice. ACOPS. ACOPS for short, yes, right? And I'm going very simple. I said before, if you want to take a sub thing here, that basically, I don't know what's happening. Let me see what happened with that marker there. That's not the marker, right? Um, anyway, I'll keep talking, right? I'll talk your trade still. That, I don't know what happened to the marker there. Right? That, um, right, okay, there it is, right? So, yeah, so we're saying basically that all hazards have a regulation. If you want, you can take a sub note of that here. All hazards, all the 10 that you had, and of course, like I said, the 10 was not all the hazards in the world, but all hazards have a regulation, right? Just you might know it by heart. And there's no need to know it by heart, but all hazards, for example, if you want to put noise, vibration, temperature, manual handling on the side there, right? And the same is true for ACOPS. All hazards have an ACOP, right? And who writes these? It's sometimes the same minister. The person that writes the ACOPS is like the same minister, Secretary of State, together with the HSE. So what they say with this, because the minister is writing these, but the first thing we need to figure out is why he will have to write this again, right? I'll tell you the why just now. But the first thing is that because the minister, you can put your minister if you want, right, is writing these, and ACOP then, if you watch this grand scheme of things, the ACOP is in a, in a sense, law. The ACOP is in a sense law. I say in a sense because what they say is not quite law. They refer to it as quasi-legal, which is another word for secondary law. Right? You could find that word in your book. It's Q-U-A-S-I, right? If, and I wouldn't be able to turn on find pages for you at the same time, right? But it's called secondary law. Now, let, let me just give an, I guess, an explanation of this, right? The first thing I tell you we wanted to address was why. Why were they going and writing? Didn't they write the regulation already? Why are you going back and writing something for, right? The answer is this. The answer is sometimes not everything could fit in the law, right? If you want an example of this, for example, the manual handling. I could have probably given you a PP, maybe for the simplest one. Anyway, I started with this one, right? The manual handling operation regulation. This is 1992, right? So they were making a law for manual handling. For those who know about manual handling, we talk about things like the person must be able to know the weight of the load, the size of the load and stuff, right? But what they're saying is that sometimes everything cannot go into a law. Now, if you wonder, well, why can't it go in the law? Why couldn't it just put it in the law? The answer is this. The answer is that if they put everything about manual handling in the law, the law is going to be too big. Physically, it's going to be like full. It's going to be like a very big folder so that nobody would want to read it. So what they do, when they have a certain aspect that they want to expand on, they write an ACOP for that, right? And an ACOP is in the form of like, um, if you want to put this so you understanding, an ACOP is in the form of like a leaflet or a brochure that would expand on one aspect of the regulation, right? I should have probably just used PP. It may have been easier for you, but I'm just assuming that you know something about money. And I mean, you must know, you must know the proper way to live something, right? By making a firm grip, right? Um, so if you want to put down that steps there, let me try to draw another stick, man. If you want to put down the steps, so those who know how to do money and honey, they're supposed to bend your knees, right? Make a firm grip. I'm going to try to draw a box or something here, right? If you know the steps in now, the steps in the manual handling, and it's not in the regulation, but it's like what you call it is in the supplementary document or in the secondary law that they couldn't fit. They couldn't put the step one, step two, step three. It was too nitty gritty then. So what they did, they put it in a separate brochure, 
they put it in a separate book, they put it in a separate leaflet, and that is what they call an acre. What you need to know here is that this one then seems to explain what this one was trying to say. The law here may have said, you know, like, like practice good money and handling techniques. The regulation would have said that, but the actual technique would have been too long to put in the actual regulation. So the step one, to make a firm grip, the step two, to bend your knees, the step three, not to twist your trunk, is that we found in the acre. You think you get it a bit? One explains the other one. Now I have one here. This is actually a book. Uh, if you can probably see the health and safety executive symbol on it there, HSE, right? So this is like a book. If you see the size of it, it's not very big. Look how thin it is. This is actually a real one, right? Look how thin this is. This is one for avoiding dangers from underground services, right? So there's a law for that, but you know, all of the fine details, right? That whatever law this was here, they couldn't put it all in the regulation. So they put a little book on it on. It's not very big, right? Um, to help explain what the regulation would have meant here by saying proper man and hand in techniques, right? So the way to remember this is an A cup is seen to be as low because it's made by the Secretary of State in consultation with the HSC. In cases where they wanted to, how we say in Trinidad, um, explaciate, in case where they wanted to go in and tell you how to live something like nitty gritties, they couldn't put all of that in the law. It wasn't really fitting to put it in the main law. So they put a little magazine on it out, they put a little brochure on it out, they put a little leaflet on it out. And if they are written by the minister, they are seen to have some legal standing as well. I have one more to do for you, right? So see if you're okay with that. And uh, just, just remember what I said now, a lot of this have to do with your project, the final project, that every hazard, watch it on this side here, have a regulation. And every hazard then has an A cup. Now, A cups have, a, let me just tell you one thing again, A cups have a, a symbol that represents them. The, the symbol for them is L, a capital L. So if you want to find an A cup, now I have some save here. Of course, it, next week I'll start over with this and start back with the same concept as well. There'll be an A cup for everything then. So if you want to get the A cup and manual handling, when you get it, you'll see it mark L and there's a number with it, L108. The way you know an A cup is that it have the, a capital L in front of it. So if you are working now, this is not for test now, if you are working, and you want to know some nitty gritties of something that you didn't find in the law, because the law would just say practice good man and handling techniques, you have to get the A cup for it. It's very simple. Next week, I'll go on Google and I'll show you. You can just go on Google and put A cups for manual handling, A cups for vibration, A cups for noise, A cups for slip trips and fall. They have them. Who published them? Not me. The HSE published them already. They are right there waiting for you to go and access them, right? So, like I said, when some people call me, uh, at times somebody had called me from courts, this, this new one in Freeport there, there was something about some parking stalls. They wanted to know the, the size of the parking stall. I just put, point them towards like an A cup. The nitty gritties then will be like, like there, right? So, um, the last one to show you would have been the guidance. And uh, really and truly, this here should have been a bit different. This line should have been different, but I will keep it there to have a full diagram, right? So in addition to ACOPS, there's another document again. There's another book. There's another magazine again that are called Guidances, right? And these guidances, they try again to do the same thing as the ACOPS. They try to explain. They try to give the difference or they try to give an explanation of what the law was trying to say. These, again, are published by the HSE. And these, when you find them on Google, they have the letters HSG in front of them. And again, there's a guidance to everything. In short then, every hazard has an A cup. No, let's take it to the top, sorry. Every hazard has a regulation. Every hazard has an A cup. Every hazard has a guidance in the UK. That's where we get it from. That's where we know to do certain things in Trinidad, right? When you get a guidance on Google, it's going to come with the letter L on it, and there'll be a different number, of course. When you get a guidance, it's going to be HSG, 
and it will also be a number. It will be like HSG38. HSG38 is one for lighting. If you are on work and you find maybe the lighting is affecting you, HSG194 is one for temperature. You're on work and you find it's too hot as it is, or maybe you find it's too cold. HSG194 is the guidance for temperature worldwide. Remember, I tell you, people use these things worldwide. You may not have been under the British, like America and Trinidad, but people use them for a source of information, right? So this one here, if you want to get right down temperature, this is one for temperature. So when you go to Google, you can try to find it. You can try to find the guidance for temperature. Just put on Google HSG194, you'll see it. I actually have it on the slide too. And if you don't know the number, that's good. Some people think they have to know the number. No, all you have to know is what you're looking for. If you want the guidance for, let's say, radiation then, you can just put HSG guidance. You can spell it out a bit, help us save the guidance for radiation and the number will come up for itself. Now, there's a little difference here with a guidance. I want to pinpoint this one. Guidances do, right? Doesn't have to be written by a minister. It could be, and that's why I'll leave it here, but I put in a kind of sub line to it now, a sub arrow. Guidances can be written by the HSE, and it could be written by this minister, the Secretary of State. At the same time, a guidance could have just been written by an author or a specific industry. For example, like BP. For example, Heritage. Right? Um, you must know, sometimes you go, you know, sometimes some of you, you'd go like, you know, maybe you would have visited a, a dentist or a doctor. And you see, while you're waiting, you see they have a set of magazines there. And you see things like... Uh, BP, or you see things like Arrive Alive, right? But they have put out, you can think of this, remember, think of these as this, as pamphlets, as little books. They have put out a guidance, but, the, but that guidance was put out by BP, or put out by Arrive Alive. In that sense, the Arrive Alive may be trying to interpret the law about masses, then about wearing a mask, and trying to show you the best way to wear the mask. But the thing is, it's just a guidance. So what they say about guidance is here, if it's not produced by the HSE, a guidance is not law because just an author could go and produce it. You could think of that as like, for example, like your textbook, right? Um, the government in the UK didn't write this textbook that you have. This book was written by RRC International. It is a good book. If you follow the book, you will be safe at work. But at the same time, then not following the book is not breaking the law. Right? If you follow the book, it's what they call a good guidance. It's good advice. It's good advice. For example, the class of last week, we saw in it the duty of the employer to maintain a safe place of work, safe plant and equipment. But by you not following the book, the book is just a guidance, right? The book is not the actual law. So if you're using a guidance that is not written by the HSC or from an author, it just serves the purpose as being a guide. And what they say about guidance is, is that they have no legal standing in those cases anyway. So quite a lot for today. What does it for today? That, that is the energy concepts for today, right? Um, I think this chart could help you understand it. All right, so I could just take a minute and just review this. You have two types of laws, statute law and common law. We briefly touch common law really as a means of creating a difference between that and statute law. Statute law is made by the state. Common law is made by judges by collecting old cases since the 10th century. Um, statute law can be in the form of act and regulation. Regulations is a quicker way of updating the law from like Saturday to Monday. All hazards have regulations in the UK. Regulations are made by a person or the HSE or both of them combined. In cases where uh, the nitty gritties is too much to say, I mean, who wants to read a law that is like the size of an encyclopedia? And in cases like that, what they do, they put out different guidances, different manuals, different pamphlets, different brochures, and those have certain names. The one that carries the letter L, they are known as approved codes of practices, and in reality, there's an approved codes of practice at every hazard as well. In the ones that are produced by, um, we can call them by stakeholders, BP and different interest groups, we call those guidances. And they are guidances for every hazard as well. Some of them produced by the HSE, and these will carry the letters HSG with them. 
Um, in a way, they don't have a legal standing because if you break these, you would not be punished. Uh, but in a way, if you follow it, it is what they call the best practice at the time of publication. Right? Um, I am just going to try to flip gears here a little bit just to give you your assignment. Um, so you can ask if you have any questions there. And in doing that, um, let me try for the assignment, right? Again, like I said, the good news is, um, you know, it's an open book exercise. You have all these things in front of you. Quite honest, quite to be honest, like I said, these questions are kind of like a dying breed of a question, right? Because um, these, are no, like, these are more knowledge-based questions than in the scheme from last year, right? So if you read through this, you'll see it about the approved codes of practices. They can supplement, as you would, they could supplement the act and the regulation. It's regarded as extension of the law. The HSC has power to make them together with the Secretary of State. We cover that. I have an example here. Guidances contain practical advice on the HSC, usually in the form of books denoted by HSG. The guidance itself has no legal standing. It contains good advice at the time of publication, right? And that's basically what I did on this side. You can read through this and you'll see it. I have a good example here, but I don't have time to run through it. So I'll leave this for next week. So your assignment, right? I, I guess I'll have to make this up because um, I have one here, but I don't know if I wanted to give you this one. Um, so let me not give you this one, right? I would have to, I guess, retype. You may want to write this one down because um, I am kind of giving this one more with a twist for the phylum project, right? Um, let me just tell you first, because sometimes you may not understand why I'm giving you this. In your phylum project, as you would know uh, from the first assignment, you have to come up with some hazards, right? Which you all did, they come up with 10 hazards. Now, from the 10 hazards, you have to boil it down to three, and you have to get the three laws that pertain to those hazards. So I know this may be a bit abstract because to write it to the market is be a little bit hard, but I'll have to call it out for you. So let me just call this out for you. I would probably um, put it up by Monday on the WhatsApp group chat anyway. So your assignment would be um, choose, I'm not sure if John, in fact, let me write it down too because I next thing I forget, right? I'm just kind of giving it this based on, the, based on your final assignment, right? So choose any tree choose any tree of the hazards from assignment one, choose any tree of hazards from assignment one, and identify Right, identify what you're seeing on this slide here. I wanted to identify for each of them, for part one, it'll be the health and safety regulation. So you're ignoring the first piece on top, you're just taking it from one, two, and three. Identify the health and safety regulations for that hazard. You could use back one I used today, I use manual handling if you wanted to. You want to go and identify part two, the approved code of practice. You can put ACOPS for short. And I want the number for your dance. If you get, you know, like if you had, what, radiation, I want the L number for it, right? And the last one would be identify the HSC guidance. So this will carry you to the internet a bit. Um, it could probably carry you also in your second textbook. Right? Again, when you do these things, if you do it well enough, I'm telling you, this is your assignment. If, if, if you do these and you keep them, when you put all these little assignments together, you just have to merge them in one. If you're using the same hazards, of course, I think when I give feedback on the assignment, I told students that if you're, if you're using those hazards, fine. I mean, from now till, um, from now till you finish your course, you may learn more hazards and stuff, but if you're using them, fine. But at least you'll know that every hazard have a regulation and you know how to find it. Every regulation has an ACOP, every ACOP has a guidance anyway, right? So do that for three of them. Um, so that means you'll be doing this, um, this will be done, isn't it, nine times? No, sorry, three times, right? So you'll have, uh, but in a sense, you'll be getting three things on each one, 
So they'll be getting nine things in all. They'll be getting um, a health and safety regulation for noise, let's say noise, an ache up for that and a guidance for that. You'll have to do it another time for another hazard and another time for another hazard, right? So that should keep you busy for the week, right? Or enough busy for the week anyway, right? So I know you all have been, like I said, going at it with a good mind. Like I said, the good news is, like I said, we started today by looking at a job. You know, the knee wash is worth it at the end of the day if you would not convince us yet. And then at the same time too, please remember that this is a short course. I know that um, sometimes it, does, it doesn't feel like that, but by the time you probably get to know us, like just one semester, it's one semester long. Sometimes it takes you a semester to get to know your lecturer and your teacher and stuff good anyway. Uh, by the time the semester is over, the first semester, that will be it. The course will be done anyway, right? So I have to run. I am two minutes into my next Zoom class, the diploma anyway, right? So I'll see you all back next week. Send me any questions, any queries on the WhatsApp group chat. Monday, I would, uh, in fact, maybe today I'll type this up and put it up in the group chat. But I'm finishing classes a little bit late today, right? So I have to leave you all. I cannot take any questions now. I am just uh, one minute into another class, right? So I'll see you all back next week. All the best. Bye. Right, I'm trying to log off here so soon as I get a log off.